Uh, and before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to thank Heffler and Company uh, for generously uh, sponsoring the videotaping of, of these talks. Uh, so I want to thank Carlene, Jonathan, and the rest of the team at Heffler & Co for helping us do this. And if you've missed any of the talks uh, that we've had here, uh, most of them are um, on uh, our website, coopertype.org. They're also on the Vimeo channel that we have. So vimeo.org, uh, or actually vimeo.com slash uh, coopertype. Uh, but everything we've had this past year is, is uh, currently up there. Uh, so you can watch the talks. Uh, you can also rewatch this one later. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Sumner Stone. Uh, Sumner Stone is a typeface designer, type founder, author, and teacher. Uh, from 1984 to 1989, he was director of typography for Adobe Systems, uh, where he conceived and implemented Adobe's typographic pro program, uh, including the Adobe Original Series. In 1990, he uh, founded Stone Type Foundry, which is located in Ramsey, California. Uh, the Foundry designs and produces new typefaces and creates custom designs for a diverse range of clients, including Hallmark Cards, Stanford University, the San Francisco Public Library, Daedalus, the Journal of American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Greenwood Press, Orion Press, and Full Belly Farm. Uh, his type designs include the popular ITC Stone Sands and the prize-winning ITC Bodoni. Uh, his most recent type designs are Devanti, Seder, and Populous. Please welcome Sumner Stone. Very nice to be here among you. Um, of course, we should all be on vacation. That's why I'm wearing the shirt. <laughs> um, but um, I'm going to talk about um, something which has intrigued me for a long time, and that is um, when I first started uh, making letters. Um, was uh, when I was, just after I had graduated from college and I studied with a man named Lloyd Reynolds, a very charismatic teacher at Reed College. And um, they seemed somehow these things to be magical. And um, I, that has never left me. <laughs> they continue to be magical and they also uh, seem, have seemed for a long time to me to be mysterious. Where do they come from? Why do they look the way they do? And I have spent a good deal of my adult life um, trying to educate myself about these questions. Uh, and um, the people who are scholars, uh, we, we have many, we have too few of them who have studied the history of letter forms, but we do have some. Uh, and they cross a number of different disciplines. But um, we have learned, particularly in the last maybe 50, 75 years, a fair amount about where our letter forms come from. And where they come from is mostly Egypt. They come from Egypt. Um, and we can trace a, a quite a few of them back to hieroglyphic forms. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to do tonight is to, to actually do that, to, to show you some of the progression from the hieroglyphic form to the forms that we use today. <clears throat> well, hieroglyphics, as I'm sure you know, you've all seen images of them. Um, they look like pictures. A lot of them look like pictures. Some of them look like pictures where you don't really quite know what the picture was that they came from, but you kind of know that it was a picture. And we're going to see some of those tonight. Um, so the transformation of pictures into letters 
is uh, one, I think, one of the truly fascinating um, conceptual, you know, inventions um, that we as humans have made. It really made writing possible. And <clears throat> we're going to look at that. Magritte is, is pointing out to us that the image is not the thing. It's a simple idea, really. But uh, we um, have a tendency to um, not remember that. <laughs> and um, we tend to assign to the symbol for the thing the same feelings and notions that we have for the thing itself. Um, and this is very common with, for example, religious symbols, um, flags of countries, um, where people act towards them as if they were the thing that they represent. <clears throat> so the conversion of a picture, a symbol, into an abstract form which is what has happened in the history of making writing, is actually not a trivial thing to accomplish. And um, we have become used to, because of, particularly because of, I think, digital images and digital photography, um, not really paying attention to how many times removed the image is from the actual thing. Um, the reason I'm showing this really is because this is the cover of print magazine. This is October 1991, that, uh, in which the typeface that I did for print magazine was announced. <laughs> and um, I, I thought it was confusing at the time, and I still do, actually, think it's rather confusing, but um, it was really a res result of both Adobe and Apple running ads that made it seem as if you bought a computer, then um, you're pretty much already done with everything, and it really didn't take much to um, accomplish a, a design, uh, which we all know now uh, really isn't true, of course. Uh, lots of people have computers, and there are lots of bad designs. <laughs> so... Um, The trick, the, the intellectual accomplishment, I would say, major accomplishment, is what is known as the Rebus Principle. And the Rebus Principle uh, involves abandoning the notion that the picture of the thing stands for the, a thing, an, an object, and uh, instead having it stand for the sound that comes out of your mouth when you say the word for the object. A sound of speech. These pictures come to stand for sounds of speech. And we have these things called rebus puzzles, which you've all seen, uh, in which pictures stand for sounds. And this is words in English. And the I, it turns out I, is a thing that actually was a hieroglyph. And we're going to look at it in a few minutes. Uh, and um, we happen to have uh, a letter that's named I in English. <laughs> so it works as a rebus. Uh, B was, was not, I think, an, an Egyptian hieroglyph as far as I know. Um, and then we have the letter M. This is one of, I think, one of my favorite Paul Rand uh, designs. M, it turns out, does come from an Egyptian hieroglyph. And uh, at the bottom of these, this is a, from a fragment of a vase, 3200 BC from a tomb in Egypt. And that, quite clearly, easy to follow, that becomes our letter M. Right on through, Egyptian. Semitic writing, and you're going to see a bunch of these, so 
I will point some of them out, but you can notice them. And they, it tends to, it's, it's the sign for um, a picture of water. Those are waves. And <clears throat> they, it tends to, it sort of has more waves as it goes along and then less waves as we get it. Um, and there's kind of a trick. It actually stood for the Egyptian sound of N. It stood for N. How did that change to M? Well, when the Phoenicians adopted these signs that came from Egypt, they simply translated the words that were the words that stood for the thing in Egyptian into Phoenician. And then they used the first sound in the word, which in the case of uh, Phoenician was mem. That was also in Hebrew, mem. Uh, this is called the acrophonic principle. When you w use the first sound in the word as the sound that the picture represents, that's called the acrophonic principle. That's the refinement of the rebus principle that makes alphabetic writing possible. You have only a single sound. And the Egyptians had an alphabet. They had single consonant sounds with which they could have written all of their words. Um, they didn't use vowels. Um, but they chose not to do that. They chose to have a much more elaborate writing system, which was connected to their religion. And um, uh, they were very proud of it. But when it was taken over, so there's the... And you can see, this is written with ink. After the firing of the vessel, it was written on the vessel. And this is a wonderful thing about ceramics is that we can actually see if, if the writing was done after the firing, we can see the writing, which is not the case with inscriptions. Inscriptions, use, somebody usually wrote something and then they somehow made it permanent by making some mark in the hard material. And that step has a tendency to uh, mask uh, the writing. So one of the things that I it really fairly recently dawned on me that a lot of the um, letter forms that we have today actually came from the human body. They came from the, the, the human body as an image of the whole body and from parts of the body. And they're very significant parts of the body. There is <coughs> the hand, which we're going to look at it in some detail, the eye mouth, head, and teeth. <laughs> Some of the things that came from the hieroglyphics into Phoenician are not so easy to trace, but these are, for the most part, pretty easy. Let's look at the hand. This image is from a cave, one of the caves in France. It's um, Paleolithic. It's probably 30,000 years old or so. Uh, and these hand images appear all over the world uh, in Paleolithic settings, but and sometimes they're more recent. They're sometimes they're Neolithic settings, but they um, they have this remarkable similarity. This is um, the way we think these images were made. It's basically, um, you know, the first airbrush. <laughs> um, with the hand used as a stencil. Um, this is sort of reverse pochoir. Here's one from Argentina. This one is probably some, somewhere between 13 and 9,000 years old. Uh, and they, these hand images fre frequently occur in clusters. Uh, it's not clear why. There are all sorts of conjectures about Paleolithic art. There are a few treatises on it you can read. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of like human paleontology. It's like you find a new bone every 
the theory has to change completely. So it's, it's mostly conjecture. Uh, but it is fascinating, and this is one from Indonesia. This is one that's actually about 40,000 years old, and this is very interesting because of the marks that occur inside the hand images, which um, have been written about, and there are different ones. If you notice, the different hands have different marks inside them, 40,000 years ago. New Guinea, and this one is uh, from Morocco. Um, and this, of course, is relief printing. <laughs> put your hand in the mud, put it on the wall. And uh, again, in a cluster. So the hand, is, the hand really is the active principle. The hand is the thing that writes, the hand is the thing that draws, the hand is the thing that makes. And we um, see that, you know, the hand is constantly in front of you and people notice that. And the fact that they made these images in such a widespread fashion is quite, I think it's fascinating. And, um, <coughs> uh, you know, th th there's not enough really to be, that can be said about the role of hand, the hand in writing. Writing comes from a uh, combination of human faculties, but the hand is so important. Here is uh, the, an Egyptian inscription, the hand images in the middle, and that's of course an open hand, flat. It doesn't really relate to the Paleolithic images, but nevertheless, there it is, a hand. Um, and there are other, both full images of humans and human parts, as we will see, for all of these letters that I images. Uh, down in the bottom uh, here, this is an, an arm with a hand. Uh, and these all stand for sounds. The, um, the hand in this place, in this case, sound, sounds for a multiple syllable jerk. And this is a viper which I always think that, could that be a poisonous snake? It looks so cartoony. Um, but anyway, that's a viper. Uh, that was F or V. And then the owl is, is the actual Egyptian uh, part of the al alphabet, which is, stands for M. Um, and other ones, folded cloth and the leaf and so on. <coughs> now, This is uh, an important thing to understand about making letters in, in pretty much every writing system, in pretty much every tradition of writing that we know about, although it's, uh, it's odd that it doesn't seem to be present in cuneiform, but that may be simply because we don't have the evidence because it's so old. And that is that um, there are different levels of writing, and we have this in our culture. We have very formal letter forms, and then we have letter forms that are quite different that come from rapid writing and they're intended for informal purposes, correspondence, laundry lists, whatever. And those forms can be quite different depending on their purpose. And the Egyptians had a very complex society and they had multiple levels of writing. Uh, this has not really been properly recorded or studied. I just got, read um, a, a little um, paper about this matter. It's the first time that I've actually seen an Egyptologist who recognizes the fact that there are different classes of these writings. You usually hear about hieroglyphic. Well, it turns out there's definitely several levels of hieroglyphic from very detailed and formal to much simpler. And um, then there's what's called hieratic, which is um, the cursive writing. So on here, what we see on the left-hand column is um, the Egyptian, what's called, what we now call, um, as far as I can tell, hieroglyphic cursive. That is, the pictures are still preserved, but it's a pr pretty simple writing of hieroglyphics. And this was also had it, its levels, but this is a thing Actually, the hieroglyphic cursive 
are the forms that come down to us through Phoenicia. On the right-hand side is what's called hieratic. Okay, in hieratic, the important thing to notice is that the, that the connection with the picture is abandoned. Okay, we don't care what the picture is anymore. We care about having a system of writing. And if you think about it, the reason for this is because writing has got to be taught. And the more people you have writing, the more likely it is to have cursive writing. And you've got to teach them how to write. And how do you teach them how to write? Well, what you really need is a system. And the system uh, probably needs to have a bunch of basic components that you can teach, and then you pe teach people how to put them together. That's how our writing system works. And that looks to be the way that uh, hieratic worked, particularly as it went along and developed, it got more and more like that. But if you look at the right-hand side, and if you are used to, if you have ever used an edge pen for writing, you can see that this was done with an edged tool. Not only that, it was done with an edge tool that was held at more or less a constant angle, which is what we got from uh, medieval scribes in our tradition. They held the thing at more or less the right same angle, and then they had strokes of various kinds, and they did them in certain order and progression, and that's how you taught writing. And so writing masters were very important in all of these cultures, I'm sure, in trying to figure out ways to, systems to teach people how to write, and that had a very significant effect on the forms of the letters. Here's one of them, here's the owl, this is the M, and um, you can see this is the progression of hieratic over time. Uh, this is from about um, 3000 BC up until about 700 BC, and uh, it's interesting in the case of Egyptian that the cursive writing, the hieratic, appeared, we, it, it appeared uh, along with the oldest examples of hieroglyphics that we have. They, both, they seem to have both existed in the most ancient examples that we have found so far. This is called the Nora Stone. It is um, a very old Phoenician inscription. <clears throat> it's from about eight or nine hundred. It's about from about eight hundred BC, eighth or ninth century, maybe a little earlier, <clears throat> a little later than that. Um, and um, this was found in, on Sardinia. Of course, the Phoenicians were seamen. They 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 traveled throughout the Mediterranean doing trading, and that is indeed how the alphabet got spread around. So they used the alphabet for various purposes uh, from the beginning, but the alphabet was borrowed. And we can see in this one <coughs> um, a number of different characters that come from Egyptian. Um, the, the one for the hand is right here. That comes from image of a hand. There's a close-up of it. That becomes our K. <coughs> Not hard to see. You just rotate it. It's the K. It doesn't really change from Phoenician to Roman. The Greeks just rotated it, <laughs> and rotating these very simple, once the symbols have gotten to this very simple state of just being a few lines, a few elements, they often get rotated in writing systems. That's a common thing that happened. Happened also in um, cuneiform. This one, look, which looks like a W, is actually what becomes sigma. It just has to rotate a little bit. That becomes sigma, that becomes our S teeth that were in there, more or less the right orientation here. The eye. This is the eye of Horus. Um, but there are other simpler eyes in Egyptian. Um, this one I think is quite beautiful. Um, here you can see uh, a number of different um, 
symbols that relate to the human body. This is the eye right here. This is the simpler eye. This is our water. And uh, this is uh, the sign for the mouth, which becomes, strangely enough, our letter P. Goes through throwing a few changes, actually, which I'm going to show you a little bit of now, uh, because it's an interesting one. And it has to do with making systems. Because once one of the issues, when you start to make really simple characters with just a few lines, just straights and rounds, or even just mostly straights, is that you don't want to confuse one sign with another. You don't want to make them too similar. Because if people get sloppy, then you know you're, it's going to be confusing. So that is one of the things about constructing a writing system that's very important, is that you be attentive about the fact that you don't make things too similar. Well, guess what? We, we, we're doing that right now. You know, we have in our typefaces, um, if you look at capital I, lowercase l, in the figure one, um, sometimes they look remarkably similar. Um, Gil Sands is actually the worst offender in this respect. <laughs> um, they look almost the same. There are little variations in height and weight and stuff, but, you know, if... <clears throat> so if, if you're just writing along, you know, making text with words, usually this is not a problem. But if you go to set, for example, anything that has code in it, like a license plate, uh, or your driver's license number, or anything that might have letters and numbers in it, then you could be in trouble. And so we have invented, for example, zero and O are the same problem. We have uh, that round shape with a slash through it, that means zero. Unless you using the O slash <laughs> in Scandinavian languages, which is an additional problem. So. Um, this is a thing that needs to be attended to when you're designing alphabets and alphabetic systems. <clears throat> this is uh, an early Greek inscription. This is from um, 6th century BC. Um, this is a, um, a, a list of omens from birds. And um, you can see here two O's, the O micron, the Omicron, which is the short O, which is the one we inherited in Latin, and the Omega, the Mega O, which is the big O, long O, which is this one, which we didn't inherit, but had some presence, I think, in early Latin writing, which we'll look at in a minute. This is a very early Latin inscription. It's on bronze, uh, and it goes from right to left. And over here, this is C-A-S-T-O-R, castor. We know that because of other th things. Castor and Pollux were twins, and they were part of the Greek pantheon. They're sort of minor gods, but um, people revered them. And um, <clears throat> so, so the, this, this letter uh, in, in Greek, uh, in the Greeks who lived in southern Italy and, you know, had colonies in southern Italy and in Sicily, that was the letter for rho. That was rho. That was r. That comes from uh, the Phoenician letter um, which is the, he the letter for the head. It's called resh. The head is called resh. Now, you can't say it very well, but right over here, this, this actually is the beginning of Pollux, and this is actually a P. It's right on the, on the break, so you can't see it very well. But um, we're going to look at some other Ps, and we'll, we'll see what is really going on here. But I, I first I want to show you the, the presence of the, of the O mega in early Latin writing, which is we have only one O in Latin. But in early Latin examples, 
this O occurs, uh, which I happen to really like <laughs> uh, for a number of different reasons. But uh, this is, again, uh, written on the, this, in this case, this is a crater, a bowl for mixing wine, uh, and it's written on after it was fired. So I, uh, I became very entranced with these variations on the letter forms that occur only early in, in the Latin script, and uh, we didn't hang on to them, we let go of them. But um, I made a typeface which uh, has some of them in it. Not all of them, but most of them. And you can see here, this is, um, these are two forms for the P, the pi. And um, here's an R, which it originally has a kind of a short diagonal piece coming out, which we think of as a leg or something. But actually, I have read that this is probably a beard. <laughs> originally, it was a beard. It's a head. Numa is the name of this typeface. Head. So now we're going to talk about the head. <laughs> Here's a hieroglyph for head. And here is one of the two inscriptions that were found in Egypt fairly recently. This was in the 90s, I think, uh, by a couple of archaeologists who were actually there to study the inscriptions on, on the walls of this uh, canyon in the middle of Egypt. This is what the place looks like. It's called Wadi El Hol. And uh, they came upon these two inscriptions and they realized these are not Egyptian. These are something else. And so it is thought that they were made by early Semitic peoples. We don't know who made them. We actually don't even know what they say. We don't know what language they were written in. But it's assumed that these are Semitic people. Maybe they were mercenaries who were along with these Egyptian soldiers, and they are thought to be entreaties to the gods to protect the soldiers, you know, just which were just like the things that the Egyptians were writing on the walls. Here's uh, somebody's reproduction of the characters, and you can see right here, does that look like a head or what? <laughs> That's a head. This character is originally the drawing in Egyptian hieroglyphs for the plan of a house as seen from above. That becomes our B, that's beta, house. And look at these guys. Look at those guys. That's the head of an ox, that becomes A. That becomes our A. Um, here's our water, water. And similarly over here, not that different. the head. Now, <clears throat> this is another early Greek inscription, which um, the Greeks really liked. I, I could say they really disliked in their inscriptions making round parts. And you can see here, the only thing that's round are the, are the omicrons. And the, the, the row is, is done this way with, with two straights. Um, as the Latins adopted the alphabet, they tended to do away with the straights and replace them with rounds. Now, there's a whole process that goes on here in, in letter form evolution, which has to do with the cursive writing, which we already talked about, in which you round off corners. One of the things you do when you do rapid writing is instead of going ba ba, you go ba. <laughs> it's a natural thing. You round off the corners, and um, then somebody looks at the cursive writing and they think, "Oh, well, that's cool. Let's do that as a formal piece of writing," and you get a formalization process, and that goes on constantly too. So there's this constant sort of rhythm of making things informal, and then people noticing, "Oh, that was cool." 
we're going to now make that more formal and incorporate it into our, uh, our script. Here's a, a, another early Latin inscription. And here you can see up here the, well, let me go back to this one because this one has, you know, again, so here is, here is the head, here is the row, and here is the P. Now, the P is the pi, but it doesn't look like a pi that we have in mathematics. Or in, you know, if you, you can't avoid studying a little bit of mathematics, how can you avoid pi? Pi is such a fascinating thing. It's the relationship between, and I'm saying this for Kitty's benefit, a fellow mathematician. I mean, <laughs> it's the relationship between, it seems so simple, between the diameter and the circumference of a circle. What could be simpler? Well, it turns out that pi is what's known as an irrational number. An irrational number, what could that possibly be? That means it can't be expressed as a fraction. Well, what? <laughs> and uh, I just looked up the proofs of, of this before, and I, I have to say, they're not trivial. <laughs> it took some thinking to figure that out. Um, there are other irrational numbers. For example, you know, we are entranced by, in design, by the golden mean. And the golden mean is dependent on, um, on the square root of five to calculate it. The square root of five turns out to be another irrational number. Um, irrational numbers are sort of magic, I think, just like letter forms. And the fact that they occur in these really simple things, you know, the golden mean is just you make a rectangle, and then you take a square out, and guess what? You have a rectangle of the same proportions. That's pretty simple, but it produces this conundrum of uh, a number that is like really quite remarkable. I think that's kind of thing is why I studied mathematics in the first place. Okay, so here's a, another Roman inscription, and, and another saying you can see up here how, how this is now rounded out. And so here is a formalization from what must have been a cursive writing of that character. Somebody liked that, but at the same time, you gotta be careful because here we, got, we, we do have this beard, so they are distinguished, and it takes quite a while for this thing to come all the way around and curve again, and then come over and join up. Um, and in fact, we still have from the fact that we use as a model for our letter forms pretty early Roman letters, we have letters where the P actually doesn't join up to the stem. I, I have done that myself in my designs. So um, that this is where it comes from. Whole body also occurs in uh, Paleolithic uh, cave paintings. And here's a Neolithic example. This is actually in the Alps. And this is, you know, this is about agriculture. This one is about hunting. So then this one is about agriculture. There's a, there's a plow and a couple of draft animals and so on. Um, this one. Uh, comes from a very interesting collection in a place called Val Camonica in the, in the Alps. It's in Italy. And uh, here is our little guy who was in the inscriptions from Wadi El Hol. I love this guy. <laughs> I mean, this comes from an Egyptian hieroglyph that um, had the, the arms raised like this and is associated with, uh, it's usually translated as jubilation jubilation. All right. We still have that, you know. <clears throat> There's another place where early Semitic writings were found in the Sinai. It's called Sarabit al Khadim. It was a, curl, a turquoise mine. And uh, from that, we have this is the most famous object that you see often. And look at what we have down here. There's our little guy. There's the ox head. There's the water. This is 
Semitic writing, this is not Egyptian writing. And up here are the hieroglyphs. There's our owl. These are leaves. E comes from our little guy. <laughs> and you can kind of see that uh, this is the Nora stone again. You can kind of see, okay, that's sort of legs on the bottom and maybe arm and another arm or head or not too clear. It's pretty abstracted by this point, but there's a little bit of a relationship left. And when you look at um, early examples of E in Latin, uh, they frequently have, and, and also in Greek, they frequently have the three crossbars, but then the vertical bar actually extends down below the bottom uh, horizontal. And that's due to the fact that this was the guy's legs. Okay, here's, uh, now we're going to enter into looking at um, writing on bodies. Uh, this is from a, a Japanese film called Kwaidon. It's three ghost stories. It's made quite a while, but it's still, you can find it. I'm not sure whether it's on Netflix, but it's somewhere online, you can watch it. And um, <coughs> there are three of them. And <coughs> the young man is having his body covered with characters by the, the monk because he's trying to protect him from uh, being, being uh, injured by, he's being haunted by a ghost, ghost stories. And um, <coughs> so he does all this calligraphy all over his body, but um, he forgets to do the ears. And the name of this story is Hoichi the Earless. <laughs> now I have a series of images from uh, Ina Saltz's book, Body Type, and she did another one too. Um, these are writing on bodies. Um, this one, I, I wonder what Adrian Frutiger would think of that. And, uh, and that one is Zafino. Uh, Zafino, it's the, a lowercase b, repeated five times. And Herman Zaf is no longer with us, just very recently passed away, but I wonder what he would think of that one. Um, and here is, I think, um, that's I love you. <laughs> There's a lot to be said about this image Arabic, um, but letter forms, making up a human body, uh, doesn't only happen in our Roman tradition, happens in other traditions. And we have really a, a lot of people have done illustrations about using, you know, that use this idea of making letters with human bodies. It's, it's a common thing. Uh, there are many, many of these things, and there are actually um, quite a few of them are um, are nude bodies, which I'm not going to show. I, I I showed this as you will see later. I showed this my the first time that my daughter, who's 14, um, came to hear me give a presentation. It was this presentation, so I took all the nude bodies out. So you're going to miss out on that. Uh, here's another one. Dancers have done this. There's a, there's some really nice stuff online. Have a look. This is um, says Alexander. This is um, done as publicity for the Alexander method, which is body work. All right. Now. <clears throat> There are examples of writing systems that have been made up since, we, we know really of f four examples. The Egyptians and the Sumerians, and it's hard to, to, nobody really thinks that they, one copied the other, but one may have had the idea first. And the current, I think the current 
feeling is that probably um, maybe the Sumerians got the idea first, but actually I don't believe that. I think the Egyptians that got the idea first. And part of the reason I think that is because of the fact that the cursive writing and the formal writing appeared together. Just about the same time as these very old, um, the first and look rather primitive looking um, cuneiform tablets. But there is a very interesting lecture given here, the last lecture we had here about um, the Cherokee language, which was invented, a, a writing system that was invented to write the language by a Cherokee person. Uh, and um, it is a very interesting matter. Uh, I'm not gonna say anything about that, but this is another invented language. This was invented by a uh, king of Korea in, I think it's in the 15th century that he was king, King Sejong, and uh, it's, it's made up. And he also, and he may have had help from his advisor, but the most recent stuff I'd read is that at first they thought maybe this was like a committee like Charlemagne had to, you know, determine which was going to be the writing that everybody used. But now I think there's the more, more, um, uh, information about the fact that maybe the king himself actually was, you know, seriously involved in the creation of this thing. Um, the vowels are um, cosmic. They're um, straights and rounds. And, but the most interesting part is that the consonants are shaped according to where they are produced in the vocal system. I mean, is that clever or what? So uh, they actually have a direct relationship to the way that the sounds are produced. Um, and this is the system that's, this is Hangul. This is the system that is used for writing in Korea today. So we have a system, and really since the Greeks, and, and really even since the Phoenician, as you could see in the floor stone, it's, it's basically made up of straights and rounds. We have straights and rounds. Those are the fundamental parts of our writing system. And the rounds um, can be circular or elliptical or even sort of squared off, roundish things. But um, circles play a very important part in our writing system, and they have for a long time. And when I started preparing for this lecture, I thought, okay, I'm gonna look at actual anatomy that you know we have inside of us. And I realized that we have circles built right into our bones. Ball and sockets joints are parts of spheres. They're parts of spheres. They have circles, they have lots of circles. And we've got, you know, we got one here, we got one here, and then we have all kinds of stuff in our arms so you know we have enormous freedom of movement and we have a guide for making circles right built into us there's the, the actual ball and socket joint uh, and there's you know the much more complex hand and here we have um, straights and circles now there are examples of Roman inscriptions which clearly made use of compasses and straight edges. And even I, I have an Egyptian example which is fairly late on. It's a, like, I think it's like second century BC or something like that. No, third century. It's a, around the time when, when Alexander the Great was, it's the very beginning of the third century or late fourth century. 
and, and it is clearly done with the straight edge and with the compass, the cartouche is done that way. So the drawing tools are, are present in ancient times, and of course the Greeks loved them. Uh, and um, this really came to um, be a major sort of fixation of people in the Renaissance, in the Italian Renaissance. The first person we know of who actually went to the trouble of constructing Roman letters from Euclidean geometry was a man named Felice Feliciano, which he did around 1450, and it was a manuscript that he did. It wasn't a printed book. Um, this was fairly early on, be right before printing started in Germany. This one is uh, another book that was done later. This is by a man named Pacioli, Luca Pacioli, who was actually uh, Leon Leonardo da Vinci's tutor in mathematics. Leonardo. So the divine mathematics, it's got circles and it's got straights. And here we have another of Pacioli's letter forms. This one is the logo for the Met. This one, this is a book by Durer. It's called On the Just Shaping of Letters. And um, Durer, of course, was an incredible artist. And he did a whole treatise about these letters. And one of the interesting things about Durer's constructions is that he has not only one for each letter. He has multiple constructions for each letter. And this was carried forward in the 20th century by those of us who started out as calligraphers by our hero, Edward Johnston. Uh, and in his book, Writing and Illuminating and Lettering, he has this illustration uh, of how you go about constructing the letter B. And it's very interesting to follow the, the description because it's a kind of a, well, you make the circles in the straight line, but then that doesn't quite work. So then you do something else, and then you do something else. And it all comes down to like, oh, just so happens we wound up with a B that looks like the sort of the skeleton of Roman Bs. This one is um, uh, from a book by uh, Benson and Carey called The Elements of Lettering. It sort of carries on with Johnston's idea, makes it a little bit more elaborate. They have their own take on it. Um, and here's a picture of Edward Johnston at the writing board with his cat. Now this is Hermann Zapf. Um, I saw this video when I first studied calligraphy, the first calligraphy class I saw, saw this video. And uh, it was a powerful enough experience to get me to move to Kansas City, uh, where Zoff was a consultant and he was rumored to spend time with the lettering artists and it was true. So I went there, I was worked for Hallmark Cards and the film was made by Hallmark and, and Zoff was there and he was wonderful. He was very sympathetic. He was um, spent time individually with us and that was a really an important experience in my life. Those letters just somehow he just they came out of him like magic, once again magic. Okay, this is a man named um, John Stevens. Oops, sorry. Here. Stevens is writing here with a brush which, which is flat. And he is writing uh, the forms of letters that are on the Trajan inscription in Rome. And the way in which he learned how to do this was from a book written by a man named Edward Kadich, who discovered how these letters were made with a brush. And the reason Kadich could discover this was that he himself was trained as a sign painter, as a show card writer, as a young man. And so he recognized when he saw these letters, aha, I know how they made them. Up until that time, people had all sorts of notions about how they were made, including that they were made with somehow with drawing tools. But um, as you can see here, 
It's hard to believe that they can, you can make them. If they're very, very subtle, difficult letters to write, only a handful of people today can write them like this. And, and Stevens is the best I've seen. Um, and this is not holding the edge tool at a constant angle. Look what happens here. You have to change the angle radically, and then you make the serif. And there are those subtle changes of angle going on all through these letter forms. It's, they're very, very subtle. Here is um, the same letter forms, pretty much, being carved in stone. This is uh, John Benson. His, almost everybody calls him Fudd. Fudd Benson, who um, uh, was a master of carving these letters in stone. His son, Nick, has now taken over the shop. And there's a whole story that goes with that, too. This is um, me <laughs> writing with a bamboo pen. This is um, sort of like the pen that was used by the Egyptians. Uh, they probably didn't use bamboo. They used the calamus, the uh, reeds that were growing in the Nile. And the marshes to um, write their letter forms. Stiff bristle paintbrush in my left hand to load the reservoir atop the browser near. This is a guy named the Dennis Brown. Good amount of ink. He's an Irishman, but he was trained in England. Stroke. It doesn't break the rhythm, but is a part of it. I can keep a consistent ink flow even in large writing by reloading for every stroke if necessary without breaking my rhythm. Notice that I move my neck to the brush more than vice versa so that reloading is simply another pen stroke in the rhythm of writing. This method gives more control than dipping a pen into a bottle of ink. This is Carl Roars. He's a sign painter in Santa Cruz and a calligrapher. This is a by a guy named Joe Vitolo. He's a dentist. This is a fellow named Seb Lester. There's a lot of his stuff online if you want to look for him. He's very facile, and um, he does a lot of different styles, including the pointed pen. And um, I sort of wonder if this last little part that he's going to do right here, he sped up. <laughs> 
Uh, this one is me again, and this one I definitely sped up. Pencil is a very important tool for lettering artists. Um, you know, it's been significant all throughout 20th century, certainly. Mm. This is um, the amazing Doyle Young, also passed away not too long ago. Has some beautiful books, logotype designer, amazing letterer. And here's one um, by an Arabic calligrapher. And it's the exact opposite from that. It's actually a long process to create a letter of calligraphy. When letters were created as an art, they were based on the human body. The letter would have a chest, the letter would have a lower part of the body, the letter would have a, a, a neck. So you can see, for example, the elephant. Which is the first letter equivalent to the A in, in, in Latin. Uh, the Aleph in Arabic is exactly the human posture. The Arab, the Aleph in Arabic is the human posture. It's a human structure. This is a Zen calligraphy. And here you're going to see a progression from the formal letter forms in Japanese. This comes from Chinese, of course, which are written lifting the tool, putting it down, very careful. Stroke endings are done very carefully. Composition is slow, deliberate. This is the semi-cursive writing. The brush is not, for the most part, lifted off. Only one lift. And this is the most informal cursive style. Uh, when I was in Japan, which I, I went for a couple of years on business for business reasons, um, I would go into Japanese restaurants with, with the, my Japanese colleagues, and I would look at the piece of calligraphy, and I'd say, "Well, what does it say?" And they'd say, "Well, I have this latest idea. You know, it's it written in a cursive hand. It's very personal." And here is. Carving, this is Stan Nelson, who worked for many years at the Smithsonian and taught himself how to cut punches. Metal type is made by first cutting a punch on the end of a steel rod with the letter form sculpted and then driving that into a piece of brass, which is then used as a mold for casting the lead type. That how lead, that's how metal type was produced from Gutenberg, we think from Gutenberg, all the way up until um, the invention of um, the pantograph machine in the 19th century. I have to do, I think. Okay, now I'm going to end with a little glimpse into my own uh, work in doing typeface design. These are pencil drawings. These are not done quickly. These are done very slowly uh, over a, a fairly long period of time, off and on. I would go back to them. And um, these served as the basis for a typeface, which has been released. It's called Magma. This is the digitization of our good old letter R, the head. 
uh, and I'm not going to go into how that works, but we'll look at it more closely in a minute. And from magma, I made an informal, a more informal typeface with rounded corners and sort of swelling strokes, uh, which is called tuff, T-U-F-F. Tuff -F. Uh, is actually kind of limestone, and the name is part of my sort of slightly probably obnoxious habit of naming these typefaces after types of stones. There's, I originally called it tufa. That's another kind of limestone. <laughs> I liked tough somehow. The name seemed better. And there's um, the place where I have my type foundry. And this is uh, a letter R, which I made specifically for the, this lecture. And I wish um, I could have brought this letter R in three dimensions with me. I will show it to you in a minute. But the reason this is, um, you can see here the letter R in this, if you look at the beard, at the diagonal, and then you look at the one in, in the actual typeface, the one here is, is a little bit closer in to the stem. And the reason for that is because I wanted to make it in three dimensions big. In fact, as tall as me. And so uh, this was a, a sort of a digital rendering of what I wanted the letter to look like. And then we actually made one. And this is the guy you saw writing with the brush, Carl Roars from Santa Cruz. Carl, being a sign painter, knows how to make stuff. And I asked him if he could do this, and he said, oh, yeah, we'll make it. And there it is. And uh, so I decided to call. Uh, I wish that this letter could have come with me from California, but um, the plane fare was prohibitive. Um, oh, there you can see the, st the modification. So there, there it is. I call him Rex, from Resh for head. And many people consider the capital R to be the king of the letters. If you've got, a, you've got a stem, you've got a bowl, and you've got a diagonal, you have a lot of parts already. This is me and my daughter. The last time I gave this talk, which was in California, uh, somebody took a picture of us. Now, so I decided to make a, a female companion for Rex. So that's what I'm drawing here. And it used to be that I was afraid to just launch into drawing stuff with the digital drawing programs. Um, but over the years, I have become more fearless about that. And so here, I just started out with the part you saw. And I, I fiddled with it. And I wound up with this form. There she is. Rex and Regina. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we could have a couple of questions, I think, if you want. I know it's late. We don't. Yeah, Kitty. You know about the AIGAY concert in San Diego? Yeah. Yeah. They had the big Y on the stage. Yeah. And they had a film right at the very beginning of the conference showing somebody constructing the big three dimensional Y yeah. and then writing it as for a cross yeah. out into the desert. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, 
I've often had fantasies about making big letters, including you know wanting to get the bulldozers or large sized you know flail mowers or something and have at it you know crop circles that are letter forms. Um, so it, it's very satisfying to actually be able to do it. But you realize, you know, when you have an actual object that uh, it's, it has problems. <laughs> yeah. Just briefly, where do our numbers come from? Well, the numbers, um, which we call Arabic numbers, uh, actually came into Europe through Arabic culture, but they come originally from India. And uh, so they really are Indian numbers. And um, they come in into Spain, you know, with Arabic culture and then into the rest of Europe. And um, any of, of my students uh, can tell you that it's really, uh, or any type designer can tell you that it's, it's um, one of the more challenging parts of making a typeface design is figuring out how to integrate the design of the numbers to make them seem to work somehow compatibly with the alphabetic characters. Uh, and that's because they come from a different tradition and they're sort of grafted on. Um, the Romans, of course, used letter forms for numbers. Um, they're hell to calculate with. But <laughs> um, they look good. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>